everybody, we are going to make a single of 100% Angora. We have our Ashford Elizabeth II spinning mill. It is set up to spin a single. So this is going to be kind of difficult to see in detail, but that's not this sort of video. We're not going to discuss viewing in detail. It's just kind of a spin and chat. So we have our bowl of 100% Angora, just loosely carded roll eggs. And the yarn that we are making is this yarn right here. It's about an 80 ounce skein and it's 100% Angora. Perfectly balanced yeah, and you know it's perfectly balanced because when you hold it, it doesn't do this. It doesn't start twisting back on itself, okay? So this is a super fine skein of yarn. Put 80 ounces somewhere around over 320 yards. <coughs> Excuse me. This does get washed. So I joined on the new roll egg to the leader line. And my leader line right now is 100% um, Angora. So I'm joining 100% Angora to 100% Angora. And yesterday, last night, when I was spinning yarn, I did uh, put a little bit of spinning wheel oil on my, my wheel. Just two drips. What I just pulled off was a teeny little bit of like a second cut. Easy to pull out. Spinning very, very fine. Because the yarn that I am ending up with, I want to be a super fine yarn. That join didn't go well. Whenever that happens, if it snaps and breaks, I throw that piece. I discard it. So this skein of yarn that we're making takes around 12 hours to make. That's if you want to uh, trim it off the rabbit hand card it yourself, spin each single yourself, ply it, all that good stuff. And I think making yarn requires patience. It's not, it doesn't line up with impatience. Making yarn Making a good quality, high quality skin of yarn is something that takes time. And learning the skills, practicing the skills. So you can learn how to make yarn. You can learn how to hand card. You can learn how to spin. You can learn how to fly. And then you learn, on, you learn uh, how to do it better, how to perfect it, how to make it better, how to improve your, what you've learned, how to improve your skills. And I think that's a, that's a fun challenge. Because it's not a challenge that anyone else is forcing you to do. It's something you ask of yourself. And so you get to be as calm and focused and relaxed and gentle with yourself, or as demanding of yourself as, as you want. It's really up to you how you treat yourself when you learning how to spin. And spinning is, when you can make yarn, you know how. It's a skill. Once you learn it, there's nobody that can take it away from you. Nobody can get into your head and remove that pluck out that knowledge. Nobody can do that. That's yours. 
There's many things that I think in life can be taken away from us. We can lose our car, our house, our job. We can lose so many things. But one thing we never really lose is, and one thing no, no person can take away from us, is the skills and the knowledge that we learn that we have. Nobody can reach into your head and take it away. So it's a very, it's a very special thing. But that goes with any skill, whether you're learning how to work with wood, or you're learning how to repair a car, or you're learning how to speak a different language. Once that's yours, once you learn it, there's not one person that can take that away. And I think we have an age where there's a lot of reliance on outside tools. So like a search engine, that's an outside thing. That's not, you do not possess all the information that's inside of a search engine. But when you possess a skill, when you have a skill, that's yours. Sometimes I spin a lot faster than this, but it's morning time, and I'm not in a rush. Even though I have three more 80 ounce skeins of this super fine three ply yarn to spin uh, by February 1st. <laughs> What is it today? It's the 25th, 26th today? I believe. This is going to be a lot of hand cutting and spinning and playing, and that's okay. Because this yarn actually, it goes, uh, becomes available at rabbitryandyarns.com on February 1st. But if you're a spinner, this fiber is on February 1st. It's also available in our Spinner's Surprise Box. So if you're somebody who would like to try this out and would like to try spinning this fiber, if you want to try to make and spin the yarn that we're making here, if you have your own Angoras, excellent. If you do need some Angora fiber, I do have that. There's so many skills, like when you look at a hat, so there's also a free pattern that'll be coming out in February. It's a, it's going to use this yarn and it's a cable knit hat. But when you, when you look at something like that, all the skills to learn to get there. So of course, if you just appreciate a beautiful, soft, high quality hat, you can obviously just buy a hat. You can just buy a hat. <laughs> That's probably the fastest way to acquire it. But then you back up one step. And it's, um, you know, getting the pattern and knitting it yourself. So you have, maybe you, need, you have your yarn, pick some yarn up. And then you can make, get the pattern, the pattern will be free, you can just make the hat yourself. But then you back up another step. Of course, there's all those skills you need to, to be able to read a pattern, which can seem intimidating or daunting at first, but it's just step by step. It's just one stitch at a time. To read a pattern, to know how to knit, to to be able to, to do that, a whole bunch of skills. Let's say you want, you want it to be your yarn. Well, you know, you, you get your Angora fiber and you, you spin up a three-ply super fine yarn. 
And then, of course, the pattern is free, and you make the hat. And then you back up one more step. And what's that? Like, you can think of it. And you can get your own rabbits. Because when you have your own rabbits, your own Angora rabbits, then you have, you have anything. You have whatever yarn you want. You have whatever socks that you want to make with the yarn. You have whatever hat you want to make with the yarn. Because when you start with the, with the base, with the foundation, then you have all the possibilities, which I always think is a really cool thing. Because fiber arts, you can build on the skills. You can always build on the skills, if you want. And then you have whatever you'd like. Once you can learn how to take care of a rabbit and use a pair of scissors and clip the wool off nicely, and hand card and spin it up and ply it up and know how to wash the yarn and set the twist and dry it correctly. My wheel is getting louder as we're spinning. But all those skills. Nobody can take those skills away from you. Once you know those skills, nobody can take it away. And it's crazy when you think about it. When you really stop and think about it, when you have one Angora rabbit, you have everything. You have, if you want a blanket, you have a blanket. All it is, is just learning a few more skills. And then of course they're very funny because Angora rabbits all have their own little personalities. And someone like Arthur, you can pick Arthur up, Arthur the Angora Rabbit, I have, and he's not gonna, he doesn't squirm, he doesn't wiggle, he likes it. Pick him up, hold him. He just, he's kind of, he just has a particular way that he likes to be held. And you just hold him and you can just walk around with him. You can set him down, he doesn't, he doesn't, he doesn't quite care, he enjoys it. So it's snowing right now, just barely. It was snowing a lot more earlier. And when it's winter, when you sit at your spinning wheel and it's cold outside and it's snowing outside and you're taking a fiber and you're turning it into something that will keep you warm when it's cold outside. That's a pretty cool thing. Not cool as in temperature, obviously. spinning I'm not typically making I'm not typically recording that would be a lot of videos if I recorded every time I spun yarn but I'll typically have my wheel downstairs so I'm upstairs right now I'll have my wheel downstairs it'll be in the living room and I might put on a documentary. Something that I can listen to. And if I want to watch, I can watch. And then I just, you know, because this this yarn takes about 12 hours to make that skein. 
So I have a lot of time sitting at the spinning wheel. So it's a great opportunity. If I want to just sit, that's great. If I want to learn something, that's also that's a perfect time to learn something. You can learn about a topic. Coming from the bottom of the trail, anyways. Sometimes spinning wheels is like detective work. You have to figure out where is the source, where is this coming from, and then you figure out why. using my foot and I'm moving my treadle a little bit back and forth, seeing if that passes. Just moved it to the right. So my treadle can be um, that I have not I have not oiled that at all in a long time. And that's something you can do too. Because, of course, it moves. If you guys have watched my other videos, you know I'm notorious, notoriously terrible at keeping my wheel properly oiled. Very good. But I ask a lot of this wheel. And for a while, for a while, I wanted to find a more portable wheel. This is not a portable wheel at all. This wheel is difficult to take to um, anywhere. <laughs> Even taking it this morning from downstairs to upstairs was not easy. This is this is a heavy wheel. It's a bulky wheel, and so for a while I became focused on uh, solving that problem. But in the end, I realized that was a problem I just invented. It's not a real problem because this wheel is what helps make absolutely beautiful, traditional, very thin, consistent yarn. This wheel's very well suited to spin the sort of yarn that I'm spinning right now. This is a very large actual flywheel. The big wheel is called a flywheel. And it's very large. Um, and it keeps the momentum. It keeps a consistent, steady momentum. And why does that matter? Well, when you're spinning yarn, a consistent, steady twist makes a more consistent yarn. Just something to think about. And this wheel, she has a name. She's Elizabeth because she's the Ashford Elizabeth II, which actually, I believe Ashford stopped making, producing these. So if you, if you know that's correct, feel free to write a little comment, let me know. But I believe they stopped producing these wheels. They actually had a different wheel before this one, which was a production wheel, which I've never, I've never used and I've never seen in person. I forget the name of it, but I always wanted to find one. 
Which of course that reminds me, I always want to just, I always want to go to Ashford, the actual company, which is in New Zealand. And I just want to see, I just want to go see where these spinning wheels come from. However, because I'm like on the other side of the earth, the globe, that would take a bit of time, coordination, and resources. <laughs> and I'm just not there yet. I have, there's too many other things. Sometimes I'll have a rabbit hopping around with me. So this upstairs where we're at right now, we live in an old church and the church was the little um, date on the side of this is 1908. However, there's parts that were built after that. There's some newer add-ons and newer additions. So this little church that we're in that we live in has an upstairs, the choir loft is where it used to be, and that's actually where I am. And the choir loft is, it was extended because it was quite small. So I'm upstairs in the choir loft, and there's these wood, there's a wood floor. Well, the, the wood floor is uh, painted white. And so, it's, it's quite simply just wood. So it's very easy when you have a house rabbit to have them live in an environment like this. They can still chew on it. Like there's a step, there's things. Rabbits will chew on anything. Like rabbits will chew, will chew on anything. They're natural chewers. They need to chew, they need things to do. They don't have opposable thumbs. So, spinning and having a rabbit up here, it's a great, just a really great environment. However, I don't have a rabbit up here right now because our dog is up here. And she has a high prey drive, so they must be kept separately. Otherwise, it will end in disaster. I'm wearing a pair of jeans and where my hands are, underneath my hands, I can see a little pile, just a teeny pile. There's some bits of hay, little bits of vegetable matter that just fell out as I spin. This comes up. Sometimes when I make yarn, maybe you experience this too, but like once you make this game of yarn, and it's a substantial scheme, it feels pretty cool, especially 100%
flywheel needs to be oiled as well. As I, as I use my spin wheel, I notice these things because it's telling me. It talks to me, it makes noises, it says, This is where, this is where I need this. I like when there's a consistent draft when we're spinning. Oh, I just noticed. It's not going super consistent. There could be many reasons for that. Just what I'm doing every so often if I if you see me pull something off, it might be just a teeny little bit of like a second cut. Maybe there's a teeny bit of vegetable matter. Just ever so often if it I notice it, pull it out. recently about a garden. We moved here to this particular property a couple years ago now. And we have not had a garden here yet. Which as you know if you have little creatures like rabbits, um, their droppings are very good for gardens and growing. It just hasn't been something that has been a priority, putting in a garden. But the interesting thing about a garden is when you have one, many times there's the, it comes, you know, you can put the rabbit droppings into the garden and it helps the plants grow and it helps, you know, the vegetables grow. And then when when your garden is done, when it's fall, you can end up with a lot of plants and food for the rabbits. So it's a wonderful little circle. But it hasn't been a focus. It has not been a priority. And in the day, there's only so many hours. There's only so many things to focus on. And that's just not been one thing that I've focused on. And as I've gotten older, I've realized a lot of the times the choices of what to focus on have to be consciously made choices. Because if you don't consciously make that choice, then you will unconsciously make your choice. So paying attention. 
paying attention to what is included in life and what you put in life has been something that's been a focus. I'm definitely somebody where what is around me visually is distracting. So if I have many projects that I've decided to do, and the projects are all sitting out within view, to me, instead of being motivating or instead of being something that propels me forward to accomplish, it actually hinders me because visually when there's too much clutter, it's distracting. It becomes a lack of focus. So a technique I often use is to reduce reduce the visual clutter and keep things very simple and to make sure the things that are visible are the things that I want to prioritize. And that way of living is definitely not for everybody, but because there's a yarn a fiber arts and fiber animal business, because we have a business, There can be a lot of temptation to make this pattern, or make that item, or make this yarn, or that yarn, or whatever. And managing that and keeping priority, keeping focus, is part of the results of managing what's around me and making choices. So a garden was a choice. Yes, we'd like one, but we don't have one. that I own, I don't actually own, they own me. They own my time, and they own my attention, they own my effort, they own the resources required to maintain them, to care for them. And I started looking at things in life from the perspective of that sort of cost. The costs of time, the costs of attention. Even something as simple as like a pattern. Find a pattern you really would like to make. Really would like to make, and then make it. And don't stop until you're done. Unless you start making it, you're like, I hate this. Stop. And I think it took a long time to come to some of these realizations in life. Because there's, uh, for myself, there's always a lot of pressure. So growing up, there was a lot of pressure. Um, the only acceptable grade was an A. And And then when you're someone who just achieves that, if you get A's, then you're typically considered smart in school. And then you're usually pushed just to go to college, in my generation, at least where I grew up. And I know it's different in other places. But there's definitely a big push because you see after you go to college, you're going to get this job and then life is going to be great. But you must go to college to have that great life. That premise. It didn't matter. What you went to college for, just go to college. It didn't matter which college you went to, just go to college. Because you see, you're a smart person.
think that was quite misguided advice. it ended up being chasing chasing somebody else's dream. And how many times when you pay attention and you listen and you watch and you see other people in life, do you hear that same sentiment? Chasing somebody else's dream, chasing the American dream, chasing what somebody else says, this is what you need to do or this is what success looks like. better, more clutter, more stuff, because the stuff, I was spending time, all this time taking care of it, and it wasn't doing, it wasn't really doing what the commercials said, what the advertisements said, what the promises were. It wasn't just giving me happiness. It wasn't giving me a sense of accomplishment. It, there was no sense of purpose or completeness in life. This silly stuff was demanding of me. It just demanded my time and attention and money and effort and resources. And then it was really bothering me because I'm a visual person and it was cluttering up my visual ability to focus. But it, through time, it became clear that things such as this, there's real in life, there are the things that are real in life, such as this, and then there are the things that are sold to us as real. They're the things that, through this concept of like social proof, everyone else is, you know, you see everyone else doing this, and it, it offers proof that this is what we must do. But there's many things over time I said I don't want. I don't want that to be a part of my life. And just because it's not a part of my life doesn't mean it's not, or it shouldn't be a part of yours or anything. This is not a judgment passed on what fits into your life. It's simply my process. But I didn't want 10 winter hats. I wanted one. And I wanted the winter hat that I had to be the highest quality, the best, made of real angora, real wool real cotton and I wanted it for example to last for years and so I have one hat and I have one pair of mittens from my rabbits and a friend's sheep and they blasted now for years And it's something beautiful because I don't have to make more mittens. I don't have to make another hat. And this hat, I literally made it to fit my own hat. These mittens I made to fit my long hands. And all of a sudden when you don't have, in my life, when I realized, when I don't have 20 pairs of mittens to sort through, to find a match, and I don't have 20 hats, to figure out where's the mittens to match these hats. When I started simplifying in life, the ability to focus and prioritize what matters became more obvious to me. 
I see like so many videos on YouTube because the algorithm pushes them to me because I, I don't sometimes watch them about simplifying and minimizing and decluttering. There's some people who find joy in decluttering, who find satisfaction in decluttering. There's some people who are like me who find that less is better. And there's some people that, that adds that sort of living would add stress to their life and it isn't what fits in with them. But I definitely found I have time. When we started minimizing and simplifying, we had projects. We have my husband and I had lots of projects we could do. Oh, all sorts of projects. Uh, we had a kitchen table with eight chairs. Let's refinish this table. And we have the leather to put on the seats and make these beautiful chairs. And the table sat there for a long time. And it was just evidence of what we haven't been doing. Finally, one day we were like, what are we doing? And we minimized, we got rid of it. And it continued on and continued on. And then life started getting more clear, more focused. Instead of living somebody else's expectation, which most of the time I never stopped to guess, you know, never stopped and took a look at. Just go with it, day by day, same routine, just go with it. But simplifying and minimizing has been something that's been very, very, very enjoyable. And the results have fit in with our life. So we definitely take raising our children seriously. And parenting takes time and effort and attention and energy. And to be able to be the sort of parents that we wanted to be to our kids, we noticed When you have this stuff that requires attention and demands of it to maintain, pay attention to what you're spending your time on. If you value, for us, this is what we were sitting and wrestling with, is when you value your children and you value parenting and being a good parent and being there for your children and trying to do too well and, and be there to help them become good little human beings, balanced little human beings. Be careful of what you bring into your life, the items you bring into your life, the projects you bring into your life, because there is only so much time. And you use it once and then it's gone. And really just like, what is getting in the way of you? Asking yourselves, what is getting in the way in the way of you being a better wife? What is getting in the way of you being a better mom? What is getting in the way of you having the sort of day that you'd prefer to have? Like there was a while, <laughs> this is ridiculous. Maybe you can relate. But there was a time, there was a period in life when it was like, I just want to drink my cup of coffee before it gets cold. <laughs> And it's those simple things that you, you stop and realize, like, something is wrong here. Something is not right. Because if I cannot drink a cup of coffee without it getting cold, and that's a very simple thing to do. Something is out of balance. Something is amiss. So we just start making choices in life. Different choices, simplifying. If there were projects we had sitting around that we didn't get to, it doesn't matter. You know, if that project's been sitting there for a year and we didn't get to it, that project goes away. That project 
We're not going to get to it. We had chances and opportunities, and if we chose not to, then we need to be honest with ourselves and we're not going to get to it. And that sort of clarity for us has been very helpful, but it's taken time. Because I, I felt the pressure from the outside. You see, people have more than just one purse. People have more than just one pair of flip-flops, one pair of running shoes, one pair of dress shoes, that sort of thing. Because we must coordinate. There's rules. Whose rules are these? Wait a minute, I don't want these rules. These rules aren't my rules. This doesn't fit in with my life. I don't want to own 27 purses. I want to own one purse. Guys who listen to my podcast know where this is going. The story of a purse. I've talked about this before. I own one purse. One. One purse. I own quite a few reusable tote bags. But I own one purse. That's all I want. That's all I need to own. I own one wallet. That's all I want. That's all I need to own. And there's something freeing in that simplicity. Just like there's something freeing in making this yarn. There's something freeing when I have the rabbit and I know how to take the rabbit from wool on the rabbit to hat. And I can stop and I can take the time and I can think about the sort of hat I want and I can make that hat. And then that's my hat. And I don't need to worry about storing all my hats. I don't need to worry about storing all my mittens. I don't need to worry about all my purses. I have one, I know where my purse goes. I have one hat, I know where it goes. I have one pair of mittens, I know where they go. Maybe some of that sounds familiar to you. Maybe some of it also sounds quite strange. Well, that is because it's not mainstream. It requires discernment and conscientious choice making. It requires a bit of effort in the beginning when you start making choices like this in life. choices anymore. You make them once and then you done. You can focus on something else. Like if you have a business that's fiber arts or fiber animals, then you can focus on, for example, sharing your business with others, sharing how to make yarn with others, sharing free patterns with others, sharing how to knit with others, sharing, you know, if you breed and grow rabbits or sheep or whatever, sharing that with others and sharing this possibility with others that there is a different way. There's not just one way to live life. And just because you're in a situation right now doesn't mean you're always going to be in that situation, even though it might feel like there's no way out, or it may feel like you're trapped. But I think the choices we make matter. And knowing and understanding yourself and what what are the consequences of your choices? Very important stuff. By the way, you know it's funny, I thought I might make this video and just not talk at all. I 
guess there's just some things to say. Soul just got up, our dog just got up and it scared me. What is it? She got up off her dog went to collapse on the floor. Here's something that, that is ongoing that I haven't been able to solve. So, the husband and I have been having a conversation about our TV. The conversation is one where we're looking at how we use this device in our life, how this device is present in our life. Of course, you know, sometimes I have it on and I've got a documentary on and I'm spinning yarn or whatever. But for a while we've been We've reached this particular conclusion that when you're sitting and you're watching TV, like a TV show, what you're really doing is watching someone else live their life. You're not really actively living your own life. In this house, that's the conclusion we came to. For now. This is ongoing. There may be developments, I don't know. But this is where we have come to thus far in this journey. At one point, my husband talks to me and he goes, it's just a black hole in the wall. That's what the TV is. It's just this ugly black hole in the wall. Now, of course, there's benefits. Like, you can learn from from a documentary, you can learn from a YouTube video, you can learn. Um, but we're really talking not about the times when you're learning something, which is like an active participation in life, but the times when you're just vegging out and you're doing nothing in its mindlessness. Those are the times that we are thinking about. And our kids are in front of screens a lot. Uh, just. For example, for school, they have laptops that they have to have and carry around with them from class to class to class. And for our jobs, you know, there's screens, our phones, all these screens. And you stop and you think about it and you're like, what is really living? What is really living about this? Am I living? Am I participating? If you're spinning yarn or doing something while you're watching me do this, then you're actively participating in life. Yay. However, if you're just sitting and watching, then what are you doing? Are you watching me live my life? Those are some of the thoughts that we had. And if you're fine, you know, it's your life. But for us, we determined, wait a minute. Look at these beautiful places on TV. I don't want to just look at these beautiful places on TV. I want to see those beautiful places in real life. Look at this person accomplishing something in life. Look at them experiencing something in life. I don't want to just watch someone cooking this food, for example, on TV. I want to cook that food. I want to taste that food. I don't want to watch.
watch someone say how delicious it is. The experience of actually doing that, that seems more meaningful than watching somebody else do it. And then, have you ever noticed in life, maybe you start like, and you watch like one episode, and then all of a sudden you're searching, you're finding this, you're finding that, and it's hours that go by. Or it was light out and then it's dark out. There's something nefarious in that. something to pay attention to, because if you don't, you just realize, ten years older, what have you done? Not that everyone has to accomplish tons of things in life, that's not what I mean. Again, it's just a personal thing, but I never wanted to be someone who looked back at my life and wondered where it went. And I'm definitely not someone who's satisfied with having all these things that I would like to do. For example, I always wanted to train um, my dogs to track, to be able to track. Track what? I don't care. Track something. And that's been going on since I was in my 20s that I wanted to do that. And I have the skills to be able to do this, but I haven't done it. When you ask yourself, is that something, if I was on my deathbed, would I regret? Maybe not. I'd probably regret the time that I didn't spend with my kids and my family because I was prioritizing working to pay for something that maybe it wasn't the best choice in the first place. Which leads me to this question I've been asked a few times over the years is how much do you want your business to make? How much do you want to earn per year? <coughs> Excuse me. This answer has changed many times. But there was never a clear, clear answer. There was never something I felt confident about. This is absolutely what I want to be. But recently there has been, and it took years to come to a conclusion. situation where I sacrifice my kids' time, my time with my family for stuff. I'm not saying like your basic stuff like food or a house, but I just never wanted to be in the situation. And the thing was, I was in that situation. It seems when I work, I work very hard. focused on what I'm doing and I want to do it well. Conscientious. That's the word. That's some of that. Thank you. 
six-figure business. It's not about the dollar amount. How high can it go? But it's about the time and what you do with the time. And are you doing and living the life that you want? Because so often, over time, you may find years go by and you've lived this life for years that wasn't really even what you wanted to live. Don't worry if you realize that, like I did, you can change that. In 2013, I had a problem. 2013, I wanted a yarn that was soft, that was made of natural fibers, 100% natural. Soft, the softest fiber I wanted was Angora. I wanted 100% Angora yarn. I could not find it anywhere. So I decided in 2013, figure out how to make this yarn because I cannot find it. Nothing was right. Nothing was soft enough. Soft enough. It wasn't, maybe it was made in an unsustainable way. Maybe it was made and it wasn't natural color. Maybe it was artificially dyed with chemicals. Maybe it was uh, the rabbits. I couldn't verify that the rabbits were treated well, um, that the harvesting was of the wool, the cutting of the wool was, was humane. Maybe I couldn't do that. I wanted ethical, sustainable, natural, chemical free yarn. 100% in more. And I wanted it to have life. I wanted it to have this quality where it was real. Like real yarn, I've said this before, real yarn, when you, when you hold it, you know it's real. You can feel it, there's an energy to it. You just, ins there's something about it, you just instinctively know that this is real. This is right, this yarn, right here. It's kind of sad, some people, some people go through life and they never experience it. All they experience is like fake yarn, plastic yarn, acrylic yarn. And they don't even know like the feeling of real yarn, what it's like to have real yarn, which I think is kind of sad. It's kind of like the difference between when you get a, just a regular store-bought tomato or when you grow your own tomatoes and you pick it off the vine and it's perfectly ripe and you pop it in your mouth, a little cherry tomato, and you eat it. And it is, gives a new meaning to the word tomato. Choosing to live life and choosing to live your life, the life you want to live. And figuring that out. Definitely a process. I don't know, I don't know why it's so hard, specifically in, in life right now. I think it's because of all the distractions. Because there's always a quick fix, an easy answer, just buy, just here's the answer, here's a commercial that solves this for you. Here, this is all solved for you. 
But I think sometimes really what we want is something like this, something where it's a genuine effort that we put in because the level of satisfaction and contentment you get when you make your own yarn is so different. When you put forth the effort, there's no comparison to going to a store and buying a knit hat compared to when you raised the rabbit, when you gave it a haircut, when you spun the yarn, when you knit the hat. There's nothing that compares to that. There's no hat to sort of that you can buy that compares to when you yourself made it from your little fiber friend, your rabbit. because I don't value owning a ton of things and a ton of stuff. You know, I've said, I've heard this phrase and I've repeated this phrase, you can never own too much yarn. And I spent a lot of time in the past year thinking about that. I think you can own too much. At least I can. Practicing 10 years for this yarn. And each skein takes around 12 hours to make. And they are a wonderful 12 hours. Even when your spinning wheel is creaking. It's just not about more. Each piece of making this yarn is heavily thought out. And each individual step and each individual skill has to be perfected, has to be mastered. Have, I have to get, I had to get to competence.
think a happy rabbit makes happy wool. And it's happy yarn. A well cared for rabbit will make lovely yarn. Just it's built in. It's just the way the rabbit grows it. It grows it with satisfaction. It grows it with happiness. All the skills to learn in those in those ten years to make this year. How to house the rabbits properly. How to shear the rabbits properly. to store the wall until I can get to it to card it. The tools to use. I've used drum carter, hand carter, blending board. I tried spinning it without carding it. And all these different things to get to this. All these different things to make that yarn. And it's all within there. Because I think the things, you know, when you get to a point when there's, there's times in life there's value in the negative. Like when you realize something you don't want. So when you're making a yarn, let's say an example is when I use the blending board. I didn't like the way the yarn was, or the fiber was. When I was using the blending board, I didn't like how it felt to spin it. I didn't like the results. And so when you learn, when you do something and it's what you don't like, you know, that teaches you as well. It just, it, it's almost like, you know, funnel. And it just slowly tapers down to exactly what you want. You've got to you've got to filter it down and funnel out, um, filter out the, the things that don't work. And maybe it's that way in life, too. adjusted the tension and adjust the sound of my ear. Sometimes I look down in my See how many I have left to spin. <laughs> I can't count. There's too many in there to count right now. Sometimes people ask for an update. What's going on on the property? What's going on with the rabbitry? Really, this past year, I haven't had updates to give. It's been anti-updates. Because instead of adding, it's been more of a year of Simplifying, focusing, and subtracting. You 
one thing that was really clear was just the amount of negativity in life and in the world and the amount of people who just are in the rat race. Going, 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 going. Not feeling satisfied. They're doing what they're told to do, kind of like I did. Living the life, they're achieving. They have the house, they have the cars, they have the everything. But it's not feeling like, uh, it's not feeling like a win. Feeling more exhausting. And just realizing that there's a way to find peace and contentment and satisfaction and purpose in fiber arts or with fiber animals. And it's definitely it's not a fix-all for everybody, but for some people, for some people, it is something that it will provide respite and relief, and it will be restorative. And the time spent doing something like knitting, or spinning, or crocheting, or going outside and taking care of the animals. Instead of spending gas, expending gas out of the tank, it fills the gas tank. For some people. So then it became clear that's really what I want to share. Once I really want to be able to offer all my patterns just for free. To be able to show for whoever wants them. I just don't want to sell my patterns anymore. I don't want to, don't want to have any for sale patterns. And learning how to ask for help has been pretty important. That's one of the things I did, is that uh, Patreon free the patterns. Just asking for help, asking for support to be able to achieve that, to be able to now free all the patterns and then the rest of the patterns that I make just to be able to ensure I can offer them for free and to be able to share, to be able to share this with other people in a way that doesn't have any financial barriers. things of what can be helpful in life to add a bit more peace instead of adding negativity to life or adding stress to life, then you've done something well in that day. more. So 
so that other people can experience the, the positives of what fiber arts has to offer, if they want. So often I have to sit up because I have poor posture. I start like slouching forward like this when I swim. And then I end up with like a neck ache and a headache. And this is a very good feeling. When I was talking, I have to like push myself back and remind myself to sit up straight. So, yes, an update on the rabbitry. That's in the property. That's part of. What I've been doing is instead of going, 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 I just stopped. I just stopped. Just one thing at a time. Because you see, I used to do like 20 things at a time. Many, many, many projects. And all these responsibilities and obligations. And you have to do it all and be everything. Terrible. And the interesting piece is it's all there for you to see. <laughs> like it's all there for you to see on YouTube if you're a member. It's all there for you to see just kind of the progression of the rabbitry over this time. You know, it's been over half a decade being able to look at this journey and watch and see. I mean, some of it. You can see glimpses. Others, maybe not. Others, you, I'm like way off track. And it's like I just leave it there because it's the journey. And through it all, it's always been the yarn, it's always been the rabbits. to use the yarn. That's one of the things too, like when you knit or crochet with 100% Angora yarn, it's actually a joy. It's it's not just a joy to look at. It's the finished product is, is not just a joy, but it's a joy and like the anticipation and looking forward to using the yarn and then the joy of using it and being able to knit with it. It's a like I don't get that from acrylic. People ask me, you know, there'll be yarn and they'll say, is this from your, is this from your animals? Is this all Angora? And a lot of the times I would have blended it or put different colors in there. And so I wasn't able to say, yes, every single product here is all from my creation. And that's one of the challenges that I gave to myself this year, which you're going to notice the difference, is everything. If you go, if you go out and meet us at one of the shows, to be able to say yes, everything here, it's from my animals. It's the yarn I made. It's the pattern I wrote. It's the item I knit with, you know, created myself. To be able to say that, that's like you, the way it, the way people respond to that, and then they realize like. What? <laughs>
can give you warm socks, which is one of these little rabbits. And you're, if you're interested in eating better, healthier, they help with that too. Because of course, you know, they're natural vegetarians. <laughs> they eat a lot of vegetables and fruit. And if you have rabbits, it's quite easy to pick up an extra bag of celery and an extra bag of carrots and maybe some extra bananas. And, well, then you have those in the house because of, you're sharing them with your rabbits. <laughs> It's, it's so funny watching them eat. If you if you have a rabbit and you watch them chew and you watch, but they have these little chins and they sit there and the way they chew. It's absolutely adorable. It's like this frantic pace of chewing. They don't really chew slow. If you take a look at a rabbit eating, there's nothing where they're just super slowly chewing. That doesn't really happen. If you have a rabbit that's slowly chewing, something's wrong. These rabbits are really into grinding it up keep their little chins going. It's very cute. I think probably one of the hardest parts of owning rabbits is uh, they don't have long lives. So the temporariness of it all. But that's like dogs too. And cats and sheep. And packers. And chickens. And ducks. Just a bit shorter than that. When I started on YouTube, I thought I couldn't really, uh, couldn't really talk about these heavy personal real things. You see, that's not what people were really doing. Then it became clear, maybe that is what should be happening. Maybe there is something to be said. Maybe there is something to share with the world. Maybe there is something that can help make the world a little bit better. When I was younger, I always wanted to make some grand change to life, to like really improve life for people. I think suffering, when you watch people you care about suffer, that's very difficult. Um, I think, you know, when you're suffering, that's very difficult. When you feel, whether it's pain or whether, it, you know, physically or emotionally or whatever, sickness, you know, it's, I think that's difficult. But. You know, as, as I've gotten older, it is clear it doesn't need to be some massive, massive change, dramatic. It could be small. So, something as humble as just trying to live your best life yourself. Not your best life as in like the consumerism meaning of your best, live your best life, but a bit more substantial and deeper than that. And you know, something as simple as just raising your kids well, being there for them, being a good parent. Those are very meaningful things. And of course, it's something. What can I do to make the world better? Well, I can share my fiber arts. I can share my my knowledge, and it can be there because maybe someone will find it right when they need it. Or maybe they'll watch it. Maybe they don't need it at that moment, but at some point, some piece sticks with them, and it just helps.
there's often uh, an easy way to categorize people. Are you an introvert or are you an extrovert? Extroverts, they get their energy when they're around other people. It's energizing, it feels uh, fulfilling, rewarding, satisfying when they're around other people, interacting with other people. And extroverts, I'm sorry, an introvert, that was extrovert. Introverts are, their energy comes from not constantly being around others, but being able to be with oneself, present with oneself, without others, so the opposite. And I'm very much an introvert. It's very exhausting for me to be constantly by others, like groups of people. It's something that takes energy out of me. And I, you know, it's not something I can't do, it's something I certainly can do. Yet, too much just drains me. And so my strengths are not in the extroversion world. But they often come from the moments of silence and solitude by myself doing something like this. If, if a person's an extrovert, Spitting by themselves, themselves might be a form of torture. It might be much more enjoyable to spin with somebody else. But perhaps for an introvert, like myself, sitting and just spinning and spinning and spinning and spinning, and nobody else is there, is not exhausting whatsoever. But it's more peaceful. found with cables using a consistent yarn, a traditional yarn, not an art yarn. They just match very well together. And I found using an art yarn just a simple pattern. 
no cables, just like a stockinette stitch. Knit, 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 stitch. The art yarn is often allowed to like express itself when the stitch is kept simple and the pattern is kept simple because the yarn itself has something complex to it. But a simple yarn, like this yarn, a more complex pattern is this yarn is very capable of being used in a more complex pattern because it's simple. And so the complexity of the pattern is allowed to speak. roll legs besides this little bit that I'm holding. any of my hair into this yarn. Sometimes when it's long and it's down like this, that's what happens. Some of it will start to like twist in there and then I, I have to pull it out. washed angora. In angora, you know, rabbits clean themselves by licking themselves. They'll lick their own wool. And so they'll get saliva on their wool. And angora often can trap dander. And, you know, there's different amounts of dander. So even a healthy rabbit that doesn't have any wool mites that's been fed a great diet kept in excellent housing conditions is just a healthy rabbit. Even a rabbit like that will lose skin cells. And dander is skin cells from the rabbit. And the wool, sometimes because it gets so long, uh, can start trapping the skin cells because it gets difficult for the rabbit once it's longer wool and more wool for the rabbit to properly clean themselves. So then the fiber itself ends up with dander in it. And you, know, you can use a blower. Um, many of you know I don't. I don't use a blower anymore. I just use uh, housing conditions and care for the rabbits and selecting the type of wooled rabbits that I don't need that tool. I don't need that tool anymore. I don't want to have to use the electricity. I don't want to have to store it. I don't want to have to maintain it. I don't want to have to care for it. I don't want to have to have the rabbit deal with it because that's one thing I noticed. My rabbits never liked the blower. They had to be acclimated to it. Can you teach a rabbit? Sure. Yep. But it's not something they liked. I had one rabbit and this was sad. But she hated the blower. So she would scream. If you heard a rabbit screaming, it's terrifying. It's like, rabbits scream when they are when they themselves are scared, when they think they're in mortal danger, when they're in, you know, a terrible situation. And it was, it was experiencing that, that that rabbit just hated that blower. And it was like, why am I doing this? Why on earth would I then force this rabbit to go through that? And some people, you might have rabbits that, unfortunately, you just you need to use a blower on them. That's the sort of wool, that's the care that they require. And for myself, seeing this rabbit go through that, it was terribly sad. I didn't want that. And I was 
So I said, I need to do better. I need to do better. I need to make sure, what can I do for food? What can I do for housing? What can I do for care? What can I do for breeding? What can I do so that I don't have to have this, these rabbits ever experience that? And it takes years. It takes years of breathing. It takes years of testing out different um, diets, different housing, different environments, different care. It takes, it took years. And I'm never done. I'm never done trying to do better for the rabbits. Never. Never, never, never. Never done trying to make a better yarn. Like I said, this this yarn, ten years ago, is when it started that I wanted a better yarn. I'm never done. And I think the rabbits, they obviously teach and they have a lot to say, even though they say nothing. But using the blower, this, I haven't used a blower with this one. So it does have dander in it. It doesn't have a lot. It's a natural amount of dander that, that is there. And so um, I'm allergic to the dander of my own rabbits. Uh, it's manageable, though. It's not terrible. It's manageable. Um, there's allergy medicine, but sometimes, you know, if I have to, if I've been spinning for a while and I take the allergy medicine, sometimes it starts making me tired, which is why I was yawning. And then, of course, it's the question of, listen, if you're allergic to this, why do you keep on doing this? Well, that's where the whole beginning of the video comes in, all the reasons why. Plus, once you wash this, you wash this yarn well, you wash off the dander. Wash the swell, you wash off the dander, and then it's gone. And then you wear a hat that there's no dander. Something else we're working on that's different. I have for years now stopped tattooing the ears of my rabbits. Truth is, I was, I was never good at it. Some people are. They can do it efficiently. And I wasn't. And I never liked it because it caused my rabbits pain. I didn't like that. Some organizations require have rules about tattooing, choir tattoos, certain numbers and certain orders and certain ears and placement. That's one thing I just, I just said no. So I was researching other options. Now certainly, you can put a collar on a rabbit. However, rabbits like to chew. But you can. It was something that was a very simple solution was using a microchip. That's it. One simple little So that's something with my American Angora rabbits. I don't want to have to have tattooing. 
but a microchip is a good alternative. And for those who don't want a microchip, um, you know, there are other options, such as if you want, you could put a collar on. And you can train a rabbit at a young age. You, know, you start them young with a collar. You monitor them, often using food like food treats as distractions. So when they start noticing their collar, distract them. Give them something else to chew on, something else to do. Maybe go on. For the most part. But of course you have to watch to the type of housing because you don't want just like any other animal, you don't want them getting their collars stuck on things and getting hurt. <coughs> For me, those were some pretty important things to be able to offer that. Each of the things, it's just one step closer to a better life for the rabbits. One of the things that we're working on is uh, like a retirement apartment for Arthur, designing that. So Arthur is he's just, you know, y'all are getting older. He's been a very productive rabbit. And as he gets older, he becomes more and more lazy. His moments of hopping around, running around, doing zoomies, think he's acting like a young little lad, they become just more calm. He's settled in his older age. He's a dignified rabbit. Very good rabbit. I can, one of my favorite things to do is I'll sneak Arthur in the bed and I'll lay in bed. I'll lay on my back and I'll just put Arthur either next to me or I'll just plop him on me and he'll just lay there. And so we're nose to nose, the little nose is going. I just pat him and pat him and pat him. And he loves it, closes his eyes. But simple things like that. But we're working on uh, different housing. So in the past, I used to use bass, bass equipment for rabbit housing, rabbit cages, rabbit pens, etc. And I had switched and tried KW, I believe they're KW cages is what they're called, or just KW, I don't know. I'd have to take a look. Um, they have the option of a better gauge, like a thicker wire, and um, Beatrix is inside right now, and she's on one of the thicker, in one of the thicker wire pens. You know, the door swings open, she can escape, run around and cause Beatrix havoc. That's what she does. She is a very loud rabbit. She's got things to do. But we've been using KW. Now, it, to get the better gauge wire, the thicker wire, it is more expensive. But the shipping was better. It was faster than bass. It was just a better experience overall. When I 
reflect back on it. And so we're always trying with housing. Always trying, you know. I think there's many people, there's many different ways for people to raise rabbits. And we each are very different, and our rabbits are each different. I may raise Arthur and interact with Arthur in a particular way. But his son, Jeffrey, Jeffrey may be, he's a different rabbit. He may not be in the mood. He may prefer keeping four feet on the ground and please, yeah, you can pick me up, but listen, that's not my favorite. Arthur, Arthur loves it, he doesn't care. His son, Jeffrey, he'll, he'll tolerate it, but he would rather you just leave him on the ground and cut him there. And Jeffrey is friends with the rooster. Jeffrey the rabbit is friends with Esteban the rooster, or maybe it's vice versa. Maybe Esteban is like friends with Jeffrey, but there's currently like some sort of interspecies situation going on where Jeffrey and this rooster seem to spend a lot of time next to each other. I don't know. The duck would like to be there too. That's a whole different story. I don't know. I can't even get into that. I don't know about that duck. There's one duck. One duck with an oatmeal habit. Instant breakfast oatmeal. It's got a lot of sugar in the duck. That is one thing. I don't know if I told you guys that. For Christmas, the duck got to swim in the bathtub. But you definitely have to clean up the bathtub afterwards. You have to bleach it out and like disinfect it because ducks are terribly messy. So, but that's what this duck got on Christmas Day, just swimming all around. It had a great time. And then, of course, you have to keep it the duck inside. Um, you can't put it outside when it's cold and wet. So then you have to let the duck dry off. Switching animals from one environment to a very different environment is difficult for them, but not impossible. A lot of times it just requires being mindful and aware. This actually just broke because I it's kind of tense, spun it. And so we rejoin. Just keep spinning. We saved some apple seeds from. I think we need two or three different types of apple trees. And one of the things we're going to do this spring is we're going to try to sprout the apple seeds so they can grow into apple trees. Now, I don't know, I don't know the sort of apples these are. Sometimes a tree may grow apples, but the seeds will produce a different type of apple. I don't know. I'm going to find out. But we would like more trees. And why not have more apple trees? It would be cool to plant them kind of lining the road. And then, you know, we'll have more apples than we need. So if people would like apples, they can just come and... Our friends and family can come and grab their, grab their apples.
Which I guess when's the last time you tasted an apple that was perfectly ripe, right off the tree? If it's been a while, then it might be something to try. Thankfully, we produce a lot of apples, and we have a lot of animals that will eat the apples. Um, you know, that way they don't go to waste. But we do have one tree that before the hard frost came, the apple, we didn't get the apples off in time, and they froze. So the apples are still on the tree. And it's winter time, they're frozen on the tree. So with that sort of situation, in the spring, we'll make sure to get those apples off. And those will be turned into compost. Spring is always a fun time. Where we are, it snows. And the snow, it's good to get snow because it acts like insulation. It kind of protects the plants, protects the ground. When there's no snow, you know, if you think of it like an igloo, like insulation, there's no snow. There's no insulation for the plants. It's just cold. So the snow is heavy after the snow melts. The snow usually traps debris in it. And after the snow melts, the ground and the grass, it's all quite pressed down. The grass from last year, that is the dead, dead grass everything on the top is pretty much dead. And it's the roots that wake up and grow and produce more grass again in the spring when it warms up enough and there's enough sunshine. So in the spring we always rake the yard and we always pick up all the sticks that the snow hid. One thing we don't do anymore is rake our leaves. We live in the country. We do not have close neighbors. Um, like house upon house, that's not what we have. So our leaves aren't, uh, at least not that we know of, a difficulty for our neighbors. Maybe they are a difficulty and nobody's telling us, I don't know. But we choose to leave our leaves on the ground over winter. And then in the spring, we, that's whatever is left we pick up. We clean up, rake up into a pile. The land that we're on is quite sandy and rocky. Um, with clay. There's not a good amount of natural uh, mummy material. So when you think of, about the rabbits and the animals really like composting their waste or putting their waste down is something that just helps even the lawn. <coughs> and we do things like um, when we cut the grass, we're mindful of something as simple as like the clippings. So when you have a more poor soil, like we have a more poor quality soil here, 
leaving or mulching the, the clippings is a beneficial thing for the soil. Plus we don't really, we don't use chemicals, we don't want to use chemicals to like fertilize or anything like that, the, the lawn. You know, the whole thing is like most of the time the lawn is like a waste of energy and time to cut it and gas. Um, but we have animals and humans and where we live there's something called wood ticks and there's something called deer ticks. These are creatures that attach onto you, onto your skin. They bite you, and then they uh, they eat your blood. So they carry diseases um, that can make our animals and us sick. And when you take and you cut down the tall grass, or you keep the grass lower, what you're doing is you reduce the habitat for the creatures like that, and um, keep them at bay. Now, one thing is knowing, keeping like the leaves on the ground, they like that habitat, so that's why we do need to pick the leaves up in the, in the spring, whatever is left, and clean up as well in the spring. Um, but humans and animals, there's various diseases and they can get quite sick. And that's, you know, naturally managing it with like chickens and ducks, that's an option. But we need better fencing to be able to do that. Because even though we live on a road that's not busy, you know, we don't want, we've never had an animal get, like a chicken, get killed by any cars or anything like that, but it's definitely something um, to be mindful of. Let's see how many of these are. One, two, three. There's three of these left besides, you know, the fourth one in my hand. And this is the full length of time of how long it takes me to spin one single for the three ply yarn that I'll make. When I'm not sitting and talking and recording a video, sometimes I spin it a little bit faster. So after this single that I'm spinning, I have one more to spin. And then it's time to ply them all together, which is fun. Because when you're plying, it's like this. You know, it's one of the final things. Once it's done, you take it off using the nitty knotty, you wash it, and set the twist and dry it. And there's something always so fun, that feeling of when you take this, this yarn off the spinning wheel using a knitting knot, then you take the moment of truth, you take the yarn off the knitting knot, and does it hang perfectly without twisting? If it does, you've spun a perfectly balanced yarn. That's always a super fun moment because when you're, you know, when you're plying and you're spinning and you're doing this, you're in control and you're doing, you know, you're trying and using your skills and knowledge and the best of your abilities to make a balanced yarn. So each piece, but there's always that moment when you take it off the nitty knotty that the truth is shown. So it's always a celebration, you should. 
It's a terrible feeling when you take the yarn off the knitting knot and it's twisting all up on itself. That is not a moment of triumph. I definitely notice I'm spinning trailing faster now than when I first started this. So I actually start with 1.02 ounces of Angora and then as I'm carting, as I'm spinning, then I ply it and then I wash it, then we go down you know, through that process, it ends up being 80 grams. So less than, you know, less than three ounces after the process is finished. Again, you're losing a little bit of vegetable matter, any second cuts or any dander, you know, when you're washing off, you're, any of that process reduces any of those things reduces the final weight, scale weight, not the um, yarn type yarn weight. So we do have some baby bunnies. I'm waiting for their eyes to open. They were born on the 20th. If it's the 26th today, they're somewhere around a week. Harlequin markings and one is a tort for their colors. I'm trailing with my right foot right now. It just feels slower than how I was just trailing by a little bit. Two of these raw legs, this one, and there's one more in there. Um, they're thinner, and then there's one that's just a little bit uh, that I need a little bit thicker. So my raw legs aren't always the same by any means. They're not always perfectly similar. So if I spin this entire bit of yarn up, entire bit of wool up. Normally, I won't, if I spin one ounce, I normally will not spin more the rest of the day just to give my hands a break. So typically, that's a pretty typical thing. Um, I will do something else, whatever else it is, whether it's um, listing something for sale or taking care of animals or 
creating you know, various pins or podcasts or whatever. But I usually give my hands a bit more of a break. They seem a bit more sensitive as I've gotten older. I notice them in the morning now. And that's one of the things I used to fear here and there, was if I cannot use my hands to do this anymore. So that's when sharing this with other people became necessary too. Make these videos and share this skill with others. Because so many people don't know how to do this. And they might find great benefit by learning how. like the snow has completely stopped here now. And the clouds are just a little bit thinner, so the sun, sun is shining a little bit more than when we first started this video. the point of spinning when I just don't feel like I have much more to say. Close to, closer to the end. Many topics, many random topics we already talked about and discussed. I used to do that. A full day of like all one thing. 
And some days maybe that'll happen again. But I'm much more kinder to my hands. entire short piece of wool that I just took out. Didn't notice it when I was hand carding, but definitely noticed it when I was spinning. And that's just part of what a machine cannot do. So I spend so much time when I'm spinning trying not to let this grow all the way in, you know, to keep it spinning correctly. And then it's always this funny point by the time I get to the end of the last row leg where it's like, okay, then you release the single and it goes all the way into the bottom. And it's something, you know, you spend all this time not doing that and trying not to do that. And then at the end, you do the very thing you were trying not to do.
after this. This is definitely going to need some oil. I don't even know how long it took to spin this particular seagull, but this one felt like it. This took a little bit longer than normal. Very close to being done. Sometimes, you know, when there's this small amount of wool in my hand and it's the last bit, it's so tempting just to let it all go. to feel impatient about just spinning up this last section, just getting it done with. But of course that's just something to not give in to. is how long it takes to spin one of the three singles to make this yarn. And currently I have so much wool all over me. Very typical, and it's all over the floor too. As you saw, like if a piece would break, I just push it to the floor. That's all we have. So thank you for watching this video. It looks like that took about two hours, 25 minutes to spin this. So not too shabby. I hope you guys have an excellent day. Thanks for watching.